So the first kind of special continuous function that we encounter when we start digging through the haystack of continuous functions are the functions that we call uniformly continuous. Now uniform is a big important word in analysis. Anytime somebody in analysis speaks of something being uniform, we're talking about a property that's meant to apply sort of universally across all possible members of some possibly very large set. In the case of uniform continuity, we're going to speak about a kind of continuity where the relationship between epsilons and deltas holds in exactly the same way for every single member of the domain of a set. So in this video, I just want us to get an intuitive sense of what is the difference between a function which is continuous on a set and a function which is uniformly continuous on a set. Let's take a look at a couple examples that illustrate the difference. So let's start out with a graph of a function. Let's have it be the continuous function g of x equals f of x equals 1 over x uh, on the domain, which is the interval from 0 to 1 without including the endpoints. So I might ask the question, how is the value of epsilon related to the value of delta that defines this function as a continuous function on this particular domain? So we can show that this function is continuous just by you know, writing out a proof whereby the universe selects a arbitrary choice of epsilon, and that arbitrary choice of epsilon should inform my choice of delta. Um, so we don't get any control over what is the epsilon that gets picked, but we should pick our delta accordingly um, so that for all x values that are within a delta's reach of the point x0, then the output values should be within an epsilon's reach of f of x0. So what is the nature of this relationship between epsilons and deltas? Well, on the one hand, one thing that we notice is that if the universe gives me a bigger epsilon, it's giving me sort of more permission to wander further away from my input value x0. So I can probably select a larger delta in response to a larger epsilon. And conversely, if the universe sets for me a very narrow target, then I probably have to choose a very narrow range of x values uh, around which to wander around x0. So typically, for a continuous function, a smaller value of epsilon is going to lead to a smaller choice for delta. It's not always the case, but very often. Another thing that we might notice is if we think about how the choice of epsilon and the choice of delta are related to one another, there may be a difference depending on where in the graph of this function that we are at. So for example, if I decide to, let's say, make delta just equal to half of my epsilon, that's a pretty good choice for the values of x for my reciprocal function that are over here. Right? Over here, it looks like as I vary the x value around x0, the y value is not actually changing by that much. Right? The, the slope of this graph is very shallow near the points that are out at this right-hand end. On the other hand, the further toward the left that I go, the less good of a choice this appears to be um, because the graph seems to be getting very steep over here. And my choice of delta equals epsilon over 2 eventually stops working. Uh, if you look at this point right here, let's see, i got to pull it down just a little bit so you can see it. If you look at this point, then choosing delta to be epsilon over 2, in other words, making my green strip of x values half as wide as the purple strip of y values is tall, the x values that are in that range actually do not all reside within that purple strip, within that epsilon's distance of x of x0. So even though my choice of delta equals epsilon over 2 might work perfectly well for a bunch of x values over in this direction, they eventually sort of stop working over here. And so then probably what I do in response is I probably decide to choose a smaller delta. Like maybe, oh, let's go to delta equals epsilon over 4. Now it kind of looks like maybe it works again. But it could just as well be possible that that choice also stops working after a certain point. And in fact, that is the case in this example. So one of the things we notice in this example is that the choice of how epsilon relates to delta can be sort of reflective of the slope of our graph. That where my graph tends to have sort of shallower slopes, we can typically get away with sort of a, a larger value of delta because the, the y's aren't changing very much in response to the x's if my slope of my graph is really shallow. Whereas where the slope of my graph gets really steep, that seems to be what's driving some of the failure of my choice of delta to entirely contain the y values within the epsilon strip around f of x0. So it might have something to do with slopes 
um, to the extent that we can even discuss slopes, because we haven't gotten to a point where we can talk about derivatives and calculus and slopes of tangent lines and that kind of stuff. I'm just going to kind of put that word in scare quotes for right now. But the big question that motivates this definition that we're going to wrestle with today is this question about whether the delta that I choose is good enough to work for all of the x values that are in the domain of interest for my function. Or might I potentially need to choose different deltas depending on which x value, which point that I happen to be at. And so there are some functions where, in principle, the choice that we have for delta is going to be necessarily be different from one point to the next point in my domain that I'm assessing. And so those functions, even though they are continuous, they're kind of continuous in, I don't know, a not nice way. Right? Because I have to do a little bit of extra work. You have to give me not only your epsilon, but you also have to give me a point x0 at which to determine my delta. And I need to use both of those pieces of information to say what my delta is. And it looks, at least initially, like this reciprocal function has that property, that the deltas that might work at some places in my uh, in my domain end up sort of not working so well once we wander a little bit closer to that vertical asymptote for my reciprocal function. And so then we might say, well, let's just shrink our delta a little bit further, maybe epsilon over 6. But then as we keep trying that, it looks like no matter what choice that we make, it eventually is going to break out of that vertical epsilon strip, even if I make delta very small indeed. And so even though this function is continuous, you need to tell me both epsilon and the point x0 in order for me to tell you what delta is going to work, such that the x values that are delta close to x0 are going to have y values that are epsilon close to f of x0. On the other hand, we might in principle have functions where that's not the case where you might be able to pick a single value of delta to rule them all, one delta to rule them all, one delta to find them, one delta to bring them all and on the y-axis bind them. Um, in other words, one value of delta that works for all points in the domain that I'm assessing. So what might a function that does that look like? Let's consider, I don't know, the square root function on the same domain, which is the open interval from 0 to 1. So my x values reside on the x-axis between 0 and 1, but I'm not including 0 and I'm not including 1. If you pick an epsilon for me, I can pick a delta such that anywhere in this domain, all of the x values that are delta close to x0 are going to have y values that are epsilon close to f of x0. And again, where this graph is kind of shallow, where the slopes are not that large in absolute value, um, that seems like it's, you know, we've got some breathing space. But then the closer that we get towards this place over here, as the slopes of the square root function do end up sort of approaching infinity as we approach this vertex here at the origin. But it still seems like my purple strip is sort of moving fast enough along with my, uh, my green strip here that this choice of delta still seems to work. I could still, of course, in principle, choose a smaller value for delta. And that smaller value of delta will still also work for all of the values in this strip. But the point is, you don't have to tell me x0 in order to determine delta. Right? I don't need to know where I am in the domain of my function to determine how to pick a delta in relation to epsilon. You only have to tell me epsilon. And I can give you a single delta that works for all points in my domain. So if you give me epsilon equals 0.2 in this example, I can choose a delta like delta equals 0.02. So it happens to be one-tenth as large as epsilon in this example, right? Um, such that all of the x's that are delta close to any point x0 will have their y values be epsilon close to f of x0. And so this is a function whose continuity is nicer in some way. You don't need to tell me where I am in the domain for me to pick a delta in response to your epsilon. I can pick a single delta that works everywhere. And so this is the kind of special type of continuous function that we're going to want to be interested in over the next couple of videos. We call this kind of continuity uniform continuity. So this, this is an example of a function which we will say is uniformly continuous. And so just to recap the two examples that we've seen up until this point, we had the reciprocal function on the open interval from 0 to 1. That function is continuous everywhere on its domain. right? And yet, we can show, and maybe I'll do this in a separate video, that this function is not uniformly continuous. 
because no matter what I pick for delta in response to your epsilon, there will be some place, some x value, where that delta is no longer small enough to make all of the y values uh, for the x values that are delta close to x naught within an epsilon distance of f of x naught. Any delta that I pick is going to fail somewhere on the domain. And in the case of the reciprocal function, the reason for that failure seems to be the fact that this function is kind of blowing up toward a vertical asymptote. On the other hand, the square root function on the same domain, open interval from 0 to 1, is a uniformly continuous function. Because no matter what you pick for your epsilon, let's pick a different one, let's say epsilon equals 0.1, I can pick a delta in response to that choice, let's say, I don't know, 0 0.007 such that no matter where I am in my domain, open interval from 0 to 1, all of the y values associated with the x values that are delta close to x naught will be epsilon close to f of x naught. So there's a single delta that's capable of ruling them all in this example. And so this is an example of what we would call a uniformly continuous function. Right? The same delta works everywhere across this entire domain. So in the next video, we want to dig into this idea just a little bit more. First of all, what does the definition of a uniformly continuous function look like? How does it differ from the definition that we write down for just continuity for a continuous function? And then maybe more importantly, what are some easy ways for us to identify uniform continuity when it happens? Are there any guarantees? Are there any ways that we can use uniformity to our advantage and recognize it in ways that don't require us to go back and write epsilon delta proofs every time. So when does uniform continuity become automatic? We're going to look at some examples in the next video where that happens.